good afternoon everyone. So what I will be discussing today is some generalizations of what Kevin has just presented to us. So now we know when we have a functional of this form, so the integral from x0 to x1 of a function of x, y, and y prime dx, from this we can, we can derive an Euler Lagrange equation. And from now on I'm going to be calling that an EL equation because I have an annoying habit of mispronouncing Euler as Euler. Um, so we can derive this EL equation which gives us a necessary but not a sufficient condition for y to be an extremal of that functional j. But as we can probably be aware, with everything in mathematics there's always a more complicated version and we'd be pretty naive if we assumed this was as hard as this actually got. So what about a functional of this form? where not just the first derivative of y is contained in the integrand, but where we have derivatives of y up to some arbitrary nth derivative contained in the integrand. Or this form, where instead of just a function that maps r to r, we've now got a vector, a vector function mapping r into rn. So we have a several dependent variable case. Or this functional, where instead of a single dependent variable, we've now got two dependent variables, and then we also have an integral over a domain in r2 rather than just in r. So what I'll be doing is showing you the derivation for the EL equation for this functional here. It's quite similar to what Kevin's done, but because we have so many more derivatives in this integrand, we have to do a few different steps. But once I've done that, I'll go through some applications of each of these, and hopefully by the end you'll be able to appreciate that it's really, once we do these generalizations, that we can show how calculus of variations is actually useful in so many ways. So that first integrand, as Kevin showed us, there are some problems we can solve with it, but it's not, it can't solve everything. There are more complicated problems that we need these uh, more difficult integrands and more difficult functionals to be able to solve. And at a certain point we will come to how these bubbles are relevant. Now before I start the derivation, I just want to remind you of the fundamental lemma of, the cal of calculus of variations, because this really is the key point of how we put this derivation together to actually get to our um, Euler-Lagrange equation. So the important point is this, this integral on a closed interval is equal to zero, and this eta function, which is one of the functions in the integrand, is continuously differentiable up to a kth order on that interval, but it's also zero at the endpoints. And then the other function, the h function, must be zero everywhere. So what this is kind of telling us to do when we do our derivation is that we need to come up with an eta function that we know this applies for. So invent on ourselves that these particular criteria fit. And then get to a point with an integral where we have something that looks like this. So we have an eta function multiplied by some other function and that that integrates to zero. And then because we know that that eta function fits these assumptions, we can then apply this lemma and say that that other function must be zero. And that's our real equation. So in the book, they do the derivation up to the second derivative. But generalizing that out to the nth derivative really isn't any more difficult. There's just some stronger assumptions that we have to make along the way. So on the sheet I've given you, if we just look at that first. So this is our functional, obviously, that we're going to be deriving this EL equation for. Now the first assumption we have to make about it is that f, which is our integrand, has to be continuously differentiable up to the nth order with each of these components inside the integrand, so x, y, y prime, <coughs> all the way up to the f derivative. And that's important because of the way we need to differentiate this function in order to actually get to our EL equation. Now s here is the set in which we find our y function. And there's two important parts to this. One is that y is continuously differentiable up to a 2nth order on that interval x0, x1. And that's important because of the way we need to differentiate this function in order to get to our EL equation, but also because of the differentiation of the function that we have to do once it's in the EL equation. Now you'll notice here that there's a lot of endpoints I've given here. So Kevin said we need these two points, the function value at x0 and x1, in order to solve the differential equation we get out the end. But in this case, you can imagine we're probably going to have a differential equation that's a much higher order. So we're going to need a lot more endpoints and boundary values in order to actually solve that equation that we get out at the end. And what actually happens is that we'll get a differential equation of order 2m. So we're going to need 2m constants in order to solve it. So if you think about what we've got here, we have got 2m constants. And that will become clearer once we get to the actual equation and work through some examples, but that gives us enough numbers to solve it. Now, h is this set 
that we define our eta function on. So remembering our eta function is that function we want for the fundamental lemma. So we want the fundamental lemma to apply. So we have to invent all those little criteria that it had. So one of those was its continuity. So we define it to have the same continuity as our y function because for, for the derivation we have to be able to differentiate in the same way, but also so that we can apply the fundamental lemma. And as in that lemma, we have to define it to be zero at its endpoints. But in order to do the derivation, we also actually have to define it to be zero at its endpoints for all the derivatives up to the n minus one derivative as well. And as I said that will come, that will be clearer once we actually work through the derivation. But that's like an extra assumption we have to make on this function. So we'll still be able to apply the fundamental lemma to it, but it's just something else we have to add on top to actually be able to get to where we want. And of course, this is the equation that we want to be working towards. So just so you know where we're going. Now, what this eta function allows us to do is to define that epsilon made of y. So it gives us the ability to say, for this function here, y hat is y plus epsilon eta. That's just some points that are kind of near our y function. So if we just do a rough sketch, that if this was our y from x0 to x1, our y hat might look something like this. So at the end points, it's going to match up exactly because of the way we define that eta function to be not only zero for the function value, but also its derivatives being zero. So it's going to match nicely. But what we can also do, because of the way we define that set containing eta, if eta is in the set, minus eta will also be in the set. So we can also have an alternate perturbation function, y minus epsilon eta. So that one might look something like this. But it still fits that same, assuming that that doesn't loop over itself and it's actually still a function, it still fits that same kind of concept. It's something close to y, but it's not exactly the same as y. And the reason we want to do this is in order to get the criteria for the max and the function. So this is kind of cheating here by drawing this as a function because it's a functional, as Kevin said, it's kind of a bit of a mess. We can't really just sketch like what I'm doing here and say this is the function y on the x-axis and this is the function of j of y on the y-axis, but I'm going to do that anyway just for, for visual sake. So if we assume that our functional has a maximum at this particular function y, so say that was here, if we take y plus epsilon eta and remembering that epsilon is a small positive number like it usually is. If we take y plus epsilon eta, that might be the point, say here, on this axis. <coughs> so this will be j of y hat. And our y minus epsilon eta might be this point here. So the same distance across to the left. So then this is our j of y bar. Now we know because of the conditions for that point j y to be a local maximum, we know that j of y hat minus j of y must be less than zero for small enough epsilon. Apologies for the, the quality neat writing there. But we also know that j of y bar minus j y must be less than zero because we can go off in either direction and the function will still be smaller than that maximum value. So now we've got some kind of sign criteria on an integral. And remembering that the way the fundamental lemma works, we want to get to a point where we have an integral that equals zero. So this is kind of hinting us to do, okay, well, let's find this jy hat minus jy, work out what it is and see where we get. Now, because we can kind of interchange between jy hat and jy bar by just changing our eta between eta and minus eta, because if remembering here, the epsilon is still a positive number in both of these. So what I've done to get from here to here is just change eta to minus eta. So I'm going to just go with this one here, this jy hat criteria and just see where I get with that one. So to find this jy hat, subtract jy, what I'm going to do is take the integrands, simplify them and see what we get. So this is pretty similar to what Kevin did. So if we take the integrand of jy hat, that's this. I have prime, but in this case we go all the way up to the m derivative of y hat, which of course just using that definition of our y hat function. comes out like this. So remembering that eta is, eta is the function here and epsilon is just a constant. 
And then again, we want to apply Taylor's theorem to this in order to get that integrand of jy back in the picture. So if we do that, this is what we get. Plus epsilon times eta partial df dy all the way up to eta of the nth derivative times partial df dy of the nth derivative plus O epsilon squared. So again, if uh, just to sort of follow where this Taylor expansion is going, if we're going around this point here, this is kind of like our f of a, and then each of these epsilon eta terms, the epsilon eta prime term, is kind of the equivalent of our x minus a that we've normally then put in on that first order term, and then the partial df dy, the partial df dy prime, and so on is like the derivative that we'd introduce at that point. And again, the O epsilon squared term is just telling us that every other term in this expansion that we haven't considered has a power of epsilon that's at least two. Okay, so now because we've got back to a form where we have that original integrand here, we're now at a point where we can subtract these and integrate them. So of course this is going to just cancel out. And what we end up with for jy hat minus jy is this. Because epsilon's a constant, we can pull it out the front of this integral. We get eta partial df dy all the way up to either of the m derivative, partial df dy of the m derivative dx, plus that error term. And again, this is still called the first variation, even though we have a more complicated kind of functional here. So we can denote this in the same way. Now, the reason I mentioned this y bar function before is an alternative way of thinking about why this first variation has to be zero. So if we think about small epsilon, obviously this term here isn't going to have a particularly significant influence on the sign of that jy hat minus jy, because remember we're trying to show that this will always be less than zero if that y is a maximum. So with a small epsilon, this is going to be pretty negligible compared to this term, so we can ignore it. And because epsilon's a positive constant, that tells us that Obviously, the first variation is what's determining the sign here. So this is what's going to be important in terms of being able to work out whether this is negative or not. So if we have the function y hat, which is y plus epsilon eta, we know that this must be less than zero. But we've shown that that criteria also has to suit our y bar function, which is y minus epsilon eta because being a maximum, we can go off either direction and we'll still end up with a smaller function value. But by the definition of a first variation, if we think about what this is, move that up, of minus eta and y, that's actually just the negative of this. So it's actually just minus the first variation of our y hat function. Because if you just substitute in eta, minus eta into this integral here, you'll see it just falls out. You can pull the minus sign out the front. So that then tells us that we now have this happening. So, sorry, that's not a six, that's a zero. So we have that the first variation must be less than zero, but the negative of the first variation must also be less than zero. So we think we've, either, we've reached a contradiction here. So what that tells us is either that this y is not a maximum, or we have to say that this first variation is always equal to zero for all eta functions. And that's the criteria we have to take in order for that y to still be a maximum. So that's just an alternative way of sort of logicking out why that has to be, why that has to be zero. Okay, so now we can look at, back at that integral we got for our first variation. And now we know that that must be equal to zero. Let me just line this up again. So now we know that this is true. The integral from x0 to x1 of eta partial df dy all the way up to eta of the nth derivative times partial df dy of the nth derivative is equal to 0. So we're not at the point where we can apply the fundamental lemma yet because we've got these derivatives of eta floating around in this functional, sorry, in the integrand. So again, we need to do integration by parts in order to get rid of those and get to a point where we can apply the fundamental lemma. Because remember, that's what we need to get to in order to get rid of that. So the first term, obviously, there's nothing we need to do. We've already got the eta out the front. But the second term, 
We don't. We have e to prime, partial df, dy prime. And obviously, because we want to turn the e to prime into eta, that's what we take as our v prime in our integration by parts. So we get eta partial df dy prime evaluated at x0 and x1 minus the integral from x0 to x1 of eta times d dx of partial df dy prime dx. And because of the way we define our eta function to be zero at both the endpoints, again, this first term is going to cancel. So then we're just left with this. So now we've got something that used to have the derivative of eta now written as an integral of eta times another function. So we're in exactly the form we now want. So we'd be able to apply the fundamental lemma on this particular term. But if we look at the next term, which would be this one with the second derivatives, this one's going to get a bit more complicated. We're going to have to integrate by parts twice because we can't just knock out that second derivative of eta straight away. So we take our eta prime against the our v prime and we get this as our first line. And now you can see the reason we had to define eta as having zero derivatives at the endpoints as well. Because if you look at that first term, we want that to cancel to be able to get rid of it in the same way we did in the last line. So it has to be zero, its derivative has to be zero at the endpoints in order to do that. And that's the way we defined it, so we can cancel that out. So now this term here is just like this one here. We apply integration by parts again in order to turn it into an eta. So we get eta ddx with partial df dy double prime at x0 and x1 minus the integral from x0 to x1 of e to 2dx squared of partial df dy double prime. And again, this first term will cancel out because of the way we defined our eta function. And we end up with this, minus 1 squared times the integral from x0 to x1 of e to d2 dx squared of partial df dy double prime dx. Is this all, does anyone have any questions at this point about the derivation in any way? Or we're all still cool? Um, yeah. Just so at the endpoints, all partial derivatives equal zero? Um, it's so up to the n minus one derivative because you actually don't, like, there's no reason to need it to be zero at the m derivative. So I'll just show why in like 20 seconds why we need to go up that far. Okay, so. You can imagine we just have to do this to every term inside that integral. And this same pattern is going to just iterate down through all of them. So the nth term, we're going to get this. e to m partial df dy m dx will be minus 1 to the power of m times the integral from x0 to x1 of e to dm dx m of partial df dy m dx. Now, if you think about the first application of integration by parts we have to do on this term, you can see that it would make sense because the first integration by parts we do, we turn the eta in the m derivative into an eta in the m minus 1 derivative. And because we define it to be 0 up to the m minus 1 derivative at its endpoints, that first term will cancel, and then so on and so on. So we'll be able to end up with this term. So now we can rewrite that integral from up here. We can now rewrite this in a form where we have eta out the front multiplied by some other function inside the integrand. So we can rewrite it like this, the integral from x0 to x1, eta times partial df dy minus d dx of partial df dy prime, all the way up to minus 1 to the m dm dx m of partial df dy m dx. And that's equal to zero. And now we're exactly where we want to be in order to apply the fundamental lemma. Because we've got our eta function multiplied by some other function integrated to zero. We defined our eta function so we knew we'd be able to do the next step. So therefore, this must be equal to zero. And that's our EL equation for this particular functional. And there's a couple of things about this that I want to point out just about this equation before we go on. One thing you'll notice, those two terms I've already written are exactly the equation that Kevin showed us. So we don't change what we have to do to the to y itself and the derivative of y. 
we still have to do exactly the same thing to those two terms. But as we add derivatives into the integrand, we just have to sort of add extra terms onto this EL equation. The other thing is we can now see why we need two m constants in order to be able to solve this. So if you look at this last term here, the partial derivative of f in terms of y of the nth derivative, assuming that's a function of y of the nth derivative, if you then differentiate that again m times, you're going to end up with a 2m order differential equation, which we then need 2m constants to solve. So that's it for the derivation. Does anyone have any questions? All right, so let's go back to PowerPoint and we'll go through an example of just how we'll actually, how we would use that in not necessarily a physically important example, but just an example question of how we do this. So determine the optimum function that minimizes this integral for just these four arbitrary boundary values. So because we have a second derivative inside this integrand, we need the boundary values up to the first derivative to give us enough, enough points. So here's our functional. Now the first thing we need to notice is that f fits those continuity assumptions that I mentioned, which is that it's going to be differentiable in terms of y and y double prime as many times as we need because it's just a polynomial of them. So that's not going to be a problem. The next thing is that the highest order derivative we have inside that integrand is the second derivative. So that means we need to use this EL equation, the m equals 2 version. And that tells us we need to find the partial derivatives, partial derivatives of f in terms of y, y prime, and y double prime. So we get these values. So they come out pretty nicely. And then we substitute those into the EL equation. And then we have to do the additional differentiation. And the thing to remember here is that the y double prime, all the derivatives of y inside the integrand are all just derivatives of x. So that y double prime there is just d2y dx squared. So then differentiate that again twice, so you get d4y dx4, rearrange it, divide by a common factor, and we end up with this as our differential equation that we need to solve. So now I'm going to open the floor to suggestions of how we might do this, because it's actually not that more, much more difficult than what we did last year. So can anyone think of a way to solve that? <laughs> Wolfram Alpha is not the answer in this case. Like, if we didn't have Wolfram Alpha, what would you do? Guess the answer. Okay. I'm sure Daniel's probably sitting here going, I taught you this because he did. Um, <laughs> but what, does anyone have any ideas? It's integration um, by separation, but you apply that about four times or something like that. Well, I don't know that that really works. Okay, what if that was d2y dx squared mm -hmm. instead? What would you do? Does anyone remember that? What was yeah. that? You calculate the um, auxiliary equation? Oh, yeah. Auxiliary equation? Yeah, you, yeah. so you, <laughs> you end up with the auxiliary equation. You assume there's a solution in the form A to the Rx. Right? You substitute it in, do the differentiation, and get the auxiliary equation for R, which then gives you the solutions for R, where that A to the Rx is a solution. So you then get that this is our general solution to that particular differential equation. So a e to the 2x plus b e to the minus 2x plus c cos 2x plus d sine 2x, where the a, b, c, d are all the four constants for this. And then we use the boundary values to solve it explicitly. So because we gave four boundary values, we've got a fourth order differential equation that's given us four constants, we'd be able to solve it. Now, as differential equations go, obviously that one is quite straightforward to solve once we remember how to do it. Um, but as you all well know, these things can probably get pretty complicated pretty quickly. You can imagine because this is applicable to any order of derivative inside that functional, we could have 20th order differential equations in this. I don't know what it would be relevant to, but you could possibly get them. So this could get pretty nasty pretty quickly. But it can also get pretty nasty just <coughs> at second order. This particular um, functional, I'm not going to work through all of it, but this is the term that causes problems. So we do everything in exactly the same way as that last question. There might be an easier way to get to this where the differential equation doesn't look like this, but that's as far as I got with this before I kind of freaked out and gave up. And even more from Alpha couldn't solve that one, Kevin. So um, <laughs> yeah, my point here is really just, this can get really complicated really quickly. And we're only really one step up from what Kevin was showing us. We're only at m equals two. So we're only at fourth order differential equations and we're already at kind of a disaster here. So you can imagine this stuff can get quite complicated. Now as for recent applications of this, um, obviously no one's going to be publishing papers about deriving that particular EL equation because it's been done and it's an accepted part of mathematics. But what people are still doing is for similar, fu uh, similar functionals, similar integrals, 
they are writing papers about how they've proven the EL equation for those. And this particular paper is about the EL equation for a higher order delta derivative um, integral functional, sorry, which is this functional here. And I thought I'd just point this out in terms of, you know, this is maths that's still well and truly being used on a, on a research level. And this particular functional has something to do with economic modeling. So it's not even in science, it's everywhere that this could be useful for. Are there any questions before I move on to the next subsection? Yeah? Um, since some uh, differential equation can, cannot be solved analytically, what would happen there? Well, I assume it, well, I guess it could possibly be that situation where there might actually not be a solution, a minimal for the functional. Or it's just like those differential equations when you see them, and, well, there might be a solution somewhere that we just don't know, or something like that. But yeah, it, it may just be that it's not solvable. But having said that, it's like, I don't know where you would need a 10th order differential equation. The, I would say most differential equations are not explicitly yeah. solvable. So what, there is a huge theory out there which tries to find properties of those solutions without, without actually solving the equation. Yeah. Like finding as a behavior of solutions yeah. without actually solving these like, like so, yeah, a huge research. You'd possibly be able to find some kind of information about it, but not necessarily yes. the actual and, and the solution itself. Mm -hmm. As an applied mathematician, if you know it's like your solution exists, you solve it numerically. Yes, that's yeah. the And then you've got something yes. nice you can compare and yeah. check whether it matches the topic. But you would probably agree that most yeah. equations are not explicitly solvable. Yeah. But then the question is, what can you say about it without solving it? Yeah. Or from a numerical point of view? Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to the second section, which is the several dependent variable case. So now instead of just a function that maps R into R, our integrand and our functional is now containing a function Y which maps R into Rn. And the easiest way of kind of thinking of this is in the way we tend to describe classical mechanics and the motion of a particle, which is usually using time as our single independent variable and the x, y, and z components that are the position of that particle as the several dependent variables at that time. So what I'll do here is I'll just briefly go through the assumptions we have to make on this function, on this function y, in order to derive the EL equation for this particular section, which I won't go through again because it is very similar. And then we'll move on to what it has to do with this guy, basically. So obviously because we've got a different functional, we have to redefine that set where we find our function. So the continuity this time is a little bit different. What the, the C2, T0, T1 this time is implying, and that you might be able to see that C is involved. So what we're referring to now is that each of the component functions of Y map that integral T0, T1 into, into R such that they're continuously differentiable up to a second order. So if you were thinking about this in the motion sense, what that's telling us is if we can find the position of our particle at time t in that interval, we can also find its velocities and its acceleration at that time. So we've got all the information we need about it, basically, once we have that kind of continuity on our function. The other thing is, again, we have to have our endpoints in order to be able to solve the equation that we get out at the end, but our endpoints are now vectors in Rn. So again, if we were thinking the particle sense, it's just where the particle started in its motion and where the particle ended up. And again, to do the derivation, we're going to use the fundamental lemma. So we need to define our eta function so that we can use that lemma. And so we have the same continuity again as y. For the same reasons, we have to differentiate it in the same way and it's got to fit the lemma. But again, its endpoints must be zero. So the zero is now the zero vector in Rn. So to get to the EL equation, we do it in the same way with the same, with the Taylor expansion, the perturbation function, and so on. But what we actually get to is a set of n equations. So each of the component functions now has a particular criteria in order for that vector value function to be a maximal or, or a minimal of that particular functional. And what you'll notice is if you compare that to the version that Kevin showed us, it's actually exactly the same equation if you consider the fact that x is now t and y is now yk and f is now l. But it's actually exactly the same equation. So what we're saying is that each of the component functions in this R to Rn function has to match just the simple criteria we had before in just the basic R to R function. So I guess intuitively it's kind of the same way as how um, a function that maps R into R, the grad has to be zero for the derivative to have a critical point because it's got to be zero in every direction 
So in this case, we're saying that each of the component functions has to give us that criteria that we got before. Are there any questions about this? Yes. What would that functional be for that example that you mentioned with the particle moving in the field? I will just get to that. I'll do one of those in about, okay. yeah, that's my next slide. I'll go through a function that is like that. But, yeah, so because of the way we can, this has kind of a direct application in motion, that's the most natural way of thinking about these sort of functions. We can actually use it to derive Newton's second law based on a particular set of assumptions about the relationship between force and energy and the way we define those. So if this is our vector that describes the position of the particle at time t in terms of its x, y, and z components, and that particle is a mass m and it's an unbounded particle, we can define its kinetic energy in this way. So component-wise, you can see that that makes it a function strictly of r prime and not of r. Now, when we have a potential energy field and a force associated with that field, they're related in this way, but force is minus del v, where v is that potential energy, and it's a function of r and t. So in terms of the physics that I assume most people here no, you know that if you're in a gravitational field, you know, it's not that your energy in that field isn't dependent on how fast you're traveling, it's just dependent on where you are relative to some reference point in the field. So this is a physically valid way of representing that potential energy. Now Hamilton's principle tells us this, that if we integrate k minus v, so that's this k and this v that I'm referring to here, over a fixed time interval that has an extremal in that time interval. So physically what that means is if this particle is under these constraints, and the constraints I'm talking about here is this kind of ideal conservative case where the energy of that particle is only exchanging between its kinetic energy and its potential energy, and we're not talking about it losing any energy to friction or anything like that. Physically that particle is going to get from A to B as quickly as it can based on that set of constraints. But mathematically what that tells us is that the EL equations that I just showed you on the last slide have to apply to this functional. So if we arbitrarily choose the x direction as our component function that we're going to consider, this must be true. So all I've done here is just chosen x as the direction and subbed in k minus v instead of l in the equation from the last slide. Now, well, sorry, so here's all these equations again for reference, and now we'll just work through what that EL equation actually tells us. So taking the right-hand side, if we find the partial derivative of k minus v in terms of x, well, that's just the negative partial derivative of v in terms of x because k is independent of position. And that, by definition, is just the force in the x direction. Then if we take that partial derivative on the left-hand side, it just comes out as partial dk dx prime because v, again, is independent of the position. And it comes out as mx prime t. Differentiating that again in terms of time, we get mx double prime t. So if we equate both sides here, you can see that we've got that the force in the x direction is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. And then if we take that for each of the components, the y and z as well, because the same equations will apply, we end up with f equals ma. And I put this picture in just because I laughed at it. Um, but also just as a reminder of the kind of conditions that we are considering here. So if you think about this sort of free fall ride, that is, kind of, that is that situation that I'm talking about, where the main energy exchange is between the potential and the kinetic, and we're not really considering that loss of energy to friction. So this is really the only case where this works. And I'm sure somewhere in here there must be a circular argument that you've kind of used Newton's second law to prove Newton's second law. But I still think this is really clever that you can actually get to something that's so fundamental to all of science just using this particular mathematics. So I think it's really cool and quite a good way of showing how useful this can actually be. Does anyone have any questions about this section at all? Because the next slide we're moving on to the next type of functional. All right. So this is my last type of functional I'll be talking about. This is the two independent variable case. So now we have a functional of this form where the function we're trying to maximize or minimize the functional for is now a function of two independent variables. So inside our integrand we have x and y, the two independent variables, u which is our function of x and y, and its partial derivatives in terms of x and y. And because we've got a two variable function inside that, we now have to integrate over a region in R2 instead of just in R. Now a particular motivating problem for this section is what's called Plato's problem, which is from a, from a simple closed curve in R3, find the surface of least total area whose boundary is this curve. Now this was originally proposed by Lagrange in 1760, but named after Plato because he was the guy who did a lot of the work into it. 
but historically the way this was actually investigated apparently was by bending a piece of wire into the shape of a curve that you were considering and then dipping it into a soapy solution. And because of the way that surface tension and surface energy minimization work, this would actually create a bubble on, on that piece of wire that was the surface you were looking for because you've given that bubble the restrictions that, that you need in order for it to match exactly the surface you were after. Which I think is really clever, getting physics to do our maths for us before we have the maths to do it. Which kind of just goes against everything every physics lecturer has told us about maths just being a tool for them. So it's kind of an in-your-face tool of that, using physics to do maths before <laughs> the physicists have the maths to do it. But obviously now with the maths we can describe it in a much more rigorous way using this functional here which quite obviously fits that general form that I've left off the top. So again, I'll just briefly go through the assumptions we have to make in order to get to the EL equation for this, and then we'll come back to the bubbles. So again, here's just our functional for reference, but our region omega in R2 has to be a connected and bounded region. So it's something like that top area there. We can't have something like that lower down one because we've got an unbounded section off to the side, and then we've got a disconnected section sort of through the middle. So it has to be something like that top, that top image there. Now our set of our set of u functions is the set of functions that map the closure of omega, which is omega and its boundary, into R such that it has continuous partial derivatives in terms of x and y and the mixed derivatives and in any way that you differentiate it twice, it's continuous basically. Now in terms of defining its endpoints in this case, obviously it doesn't have just two endpoints like we had before. So the way we define endpoints in this particular case is by defining the endpoints being the whole boundary. And the way this is done is by just picking a, u, a u0 function that's in u. So if you think about what this u0 function would normally do, on its natural domain it's going to just sketch a surface in R3. But if we just take it for each of those x and y values along this curve, what it will do is just tell us a z-value for all of these points. So essentially then what it's doing is just sketching a curve in R3 and that's exactly what we want. So if we're talking back to the bubbles case, that's just the piece of wire that we're using. So again, we have to use our eta function in order to get to the fundamental lemma and to be able to apply it. So it's got the same continuity again as our u function and also it must be zero all the way around the boundary because that's its equivalent of being zero at the endpoints. So at first, oh, before I say that, um, getting to the EL equation this time is a lot more complicated because we have to use double integrals. You've got to come up with a lot more kind of tricks to get there. So last time the only trick we really had to use was integration by parts, but this time you've got to use Green's theorem and a couple of other theorems about double integrals in order to actually get to this point. And at first glance, this does look a lot more complicated than what we've seen before just because of all those partial derivatives there. So it looks kind of messy, but really if you just block out the first term and look at the second two, again it does look pretty similar to what we had before. In the same way that if you look at a, um, like a Taylor polynomial for two variables, it still looks pretty similar to the Taylor polynomial of each of those individually kind of just mashed together. So it's still all quite similar stuff, just once we generalize we end up with things that look a little bit more complicated potentially. Now, let's get to the bubbles. So, what I've got here, hopefully you'll all be able to see, I've just got a few curves and a tub of bubble mix, basically. And so, the first one here, so this one's just a circle, right? Nothing special, it's just a plain curve in R2. So, no one gets any prizes for guessing what this is going to look like when I dip it in. And we just get that plain surface, right? So, it's just the flat surface that that coats. Nothing unexpected. So that's just telling us the minimal surface there is just the plane area that it encloses. But if we go into something slightly more complicated, so if we take this curve, so we're still fairly simple in terms of a curve in R3, but it's not plane anymore, right? You can imagine that the minimal surface is not going to be just the surface that does this, right? It's going to get more complicated than that. And what we actually get is this. So it's kind of, trying to, it's only so, it's not really a problem dripping everywhere. It's kind of a bit of a saddle point in the middle, if you can see it. Oops. <laughs> so you can see it dips down in the middle. So it's not flat in any way. It's not just creating a flat plane curve 
around like that. It is dipping down in the middle and creating a different kind of surface. Now, the more complicated curve that I want to show you is this one, and this kind of comes back into what we were just, what Kevin said, and what I've said as well about the EL equation isn't just. Not every solution of that equation will fit a solution, a maximal of the functional or a minimal of the functional. You get potentially multiple solutions or potentially irrelevant solutions. And I'll bring this one around because it's actually really cool to see. But if I just did this one in, the first solution I get, it actually has kind of a junction here. It matches up in the middle. But I can pop that and get another solution. So I actually get two true. different solutions for this curve. Oops. So we've potentially either got a local maximum, sorry, a local minimum, global minimum sort of situation going on, or one of those kind of one of those solutions that's just stable but not really a minimum. Or anyway, so I'll bring this one around so you guys can see it because I think this is pretty cool. You want me to carry the soap for you? Oh, yeah, that would probably be helpful. Thank you. So lovely. I mean, my guess would be that this is the most stable one because this is the one that always forms. So if you look closely, you can see that there's actually sort of two bubbles here that are meeting in the middle. But if I pop that, it splits and it then creates a surface that goes round the outside. So, let me just do that again. So this is still a valid solution because the whole bubble is still touching the piece of wire. So that's still a solution here. So it's not like we've then gone that it doesn't touch some of the wire. So it is still a solution. Okay, let's go around the other side. Sorry, I feel like I'm <laughs> directing you around. Okay, so, Again, so this is what the curve looks like if you didn't see it the first time. So it is kind of just a turn in the middle. But other than that, it's really just a circle. So again, the first solution we get out, if you look closely in the middle, it matches up. So there's kind of a bit in there that's shared between two solutions. Ah, Oops. too slow. Then if I pop that bit in the middle, there's another solution formed. So now there's no bubble through the middle. What we actually get is that solution around over the top. So now the bubble is between here and here. Yeah. So we've got essentially two solutions on this. So as I said, okay, that's probably it. Thank you. So as I said, um, it's hard to judge, you know, based on this, what's actually a solution. What's the global minimum? What's the local minimum? What's just some other, some other bubble that just decided to form? But I just think that's kind of cooler than just looking at a slide the whole time. Um, okay, so, does anyone have any questions about that, by the way? Yes? In this one, in the formulation you have before, you have functions, so the yes. surface was a graph. Yeah. But in this last one, it's not the graph of a function. So yeah, so it wouldn't necessarily be a function anymore. How would you um, handle this mathematics? Well, I mean, I think that particular one probably wouldn't. Um, wouldn't necessarily be a function. There's probably some way you can move it, I guess, that it, I don't know, take it piecewise in some way that you could sort of turn it into a function or take some kind of variable change or something. But um, I'm sure there'd have to be some way of, of solving that. Yeah, I, I, have I know there is some way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 That this formulation yeah. is not. Yeah, not so obviously that curve is not a function. We can't, time. yeah. So that's not going to work all the time, that curve not strictly being a function, but there's going to be some kind of change of variables or something we can do in order to solve it. Um, okay. By the so, way, he just remarked that the second solution you got is actually a Mobius strip. Yeah, uh, okay. so kind of. oriented one if you look at it. Oh, okay. So I'll have to take that again later then. Yes. Um, <laughs> is okay, that the one so, on the right hand side though? Oh no, this is just, it, it's kind of similar to that. I picked these pictures out because it sort of looks like what that bubble was doing, that we've got some that it kind of looks like you just pop the middle and it's formed a new solution, basically. Um, but in terms of this problem, because mathematicians want to solve these sort of things for every type of curve and surface they can possibly think of, even though... So this is going to, sorry, this is going to have applications in physics and engineering and architecture, all those sort of things you can think of where you're thinking about minimal surfaces. It's even relevant in biology because of the way cell membranes form and in other similar areas. But Obviously, mathematicians wanting to solve for everything, it actually means they haven't solved for every possible type of curve that there is yet. And this paper claims to use a new theory called differential chains in order to solve for a lot of the things we didn't know before. And there's just a couple of things about it that I want to point out. And one is the date. So this is really recent stuff. Um, that problem's from about 250 years ago, and it's still being solved, technically. But also, just in this excerpt of the abstract that just mentions some of the different types of surfaces 
that this is solving that we didn't know before. So to me, this is really just you know highlighting how much we didn't know up until the 1st of January this year. Uh, does anyone have any questions before I just conclude? All right, so hopefully what I've been able to, to show you is that that first functional, it's all well and good, it's pretty cool, we can get an EL equation to solve it, but in terms of being actually able to apply this in any way, we need to have these more general kinds of functional and the more general forms of the EL equation that we get out of those in order to apply it in science, in mathematics, in economics and in vastly many areas and to be able to play with the bubbles. So that's it for me.